Good afternoon, everyone. I'll ask you all to please take a seat and we will get our program started momentarily. Thank you so much for being here and for braving the Los Angeles traffic. Really glad to see you all here. We're gonna have a dynamic conversation. And so welcome, we'll get started very shortly. Wonderful. Well, to get our program started, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Zaichner, the CEO of A Place Called Home, our wonderful host today. All right. Thank you so much. I think I'm far enough away from you that I can, I can take my mask off, if you don't mind. Um, welcome to a place called home. We are really proud to be serving this community of historic South Central. We've been doing so for 29 years. We provide all kinds of services here for youth and families, and this space we're in, the Bridge Theater, was designed and built just a few years ago to host events just like this, and cultural events, and theater, you know, from our kids, and, to, and during the day it's a classroom. We have a high school here on campus during the day, and then after school programs. Um, in fact, some of our young people have participated in setting the room up today and helped with some of the technical support, lights and sound. Oh, that, that was good. That was a good kid. Uh, so we're, we're really proud to be a sponsoring organization for this event this evening. It's so important to bring the candidates right here into our community and get some real-time, uh, real interaction with folks. So thanks to all the folks who have made today possible. You'll be hearing about them in a moment. Um, I do want to say, you know, this community is a beautiful community. And it's one that has contributed to the heart and soul and continues to do so for all of Los Angeles. And it's also a community that deserves more love and more support and more attention. And I hope that the candidates here tonight, because one of them will most likely be the mayor of this great city, will not be strangers to this neighborhood. We'll keep coming back to this neighborhood, talking to our constituents to, so they understand what's really needed here and getting involved and bringing the resources of the city to make this an even safer, more beautiful neighborhood for the youth and families that live here. So with Without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce a couple of folks who are going to keep this rolling. Uh, one of them, them is Manny Aceves, I hope I'm saying that correctly, the Associate Dean for Strategic Engagement at LMU School of Education, and Jamika Marshall, who's the Vice President of Programs for the Los Angeles Urban League. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, make sure and let these folks know what's on your mind. Um, thanks everybody for being here with us today. We're excited to ho host this important conversation around education. Um, first off, we would like to acknowledge some special guests with us here today. Um, LAUSD board members Nick Melvon and Tanya Ortiz Franklin. Um, as well as uh, Martha Alvarez, the Director of Government Affairs at LAUSD. Superintendent Alberto uh, Carvalho. <laughs> LA County Office of Education Board member Betty Forrester. Yeah. And Myra Castrejon uh, at the California Charter School Association. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, for the past two months, we've been coming together to thoughtfully develop a program and key topic areas that reflect the key issues facing our education system in Los Angeles and all the issues um, that impact education. 
And good evening again and welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Manny Aceves, Associate Dean Strategic Engagement at Loyola Marymount University School of Education. Thank you so much for being here. We recognize tonight this time is a critical moment. Now, as we near optimistically a post-pandemic environment, we have to recognize the significant challenges our region has faced. But in the same breath, we also need to recognize the opportunity in front of us. We need to be committed in this moment in coming together to support our new leadership in the city. But what we really need to do is continue to anchor the needs of those that have been most historically marginalized, and especially anchor the needs of our students, our families, and our communities. The sponsoring groups that have brought together tonight's planning event uh, represent thousands of students, families, and caregivers, educators, school leaders, education advocates, and social justice champions. We want to acknowledge and thank these organizations tonight. First, a place called home. Alliance for a Better Community. Communities and Schools of Los Angeles. Diversity and Leadership Institute. Innovate Public Schools. The LA Coalition for Excellent Public Schools. The Los Angeles Urban League. Loyola Marymount University School of Education, Para Los Niños, the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools, and CD9 Coalition for providing tonight's refreshments. We also want to thank uh, the organizations that signed on as supporters of the event and in doing so affirm their support of having the mayoral candidates talk about education and have who also these supporters have been helping us do the outreach for the event. So thank you all. Next, I would like to introduce Elmer Rolden, who is the Executive Director of Community and Schools Los Angeles. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we know that this is a critical moment for education in Los Angeles. And although we've come a long way since the start of the pandemic, we know that we are still really far uh, from the end of it. We're not in the clear. We know that the pandemic shone a light on the vast needs that our students are facing today, whether it's academic challenges, economic, mental, emotional, and so many other issues that our children are facing. So we have a unique opportunity here today for the mayor to play a key role in helping us achieve a more equitable education system in Los Angeles. The organizations around the room have decades of experience fighting to improve the quality of education and helping students uh, get ahead. No doubt that we are committed to continuing the fight, but our question for the candidates that are gonna be with us here today is, do they have uh, the commitment to help students uh, continue along. A recent poll among registered voters in the city of Los Angeles was released last month by our friends at Great Public Schools Now. In it, we learned that voters are adamant that the next mayor of Los Angeles has the responsibility to prioritize education. 85% of respondents believe that the mayor is responsible for the quality of education provided to LAUSD students. And 59% say that they want the next mayor to take a more active role in decisions that impact LA schools more than the previous mayors have. And then lastly, 77% believe that the mayor should be held accountable for ensuring that all children in Los Angeles can uh, attend a good school uh, in the city. We know that Los Angeles is different than other large school districts because of course we are governed by an elected board, uh, not by the mayor. Uh, still, the mayor and the city are responsible for the well-being of children and young people living and attending schools here in this city. So the focus of today's conversation is on the intersections rather than the separations between the school district and the municipality. So the key issues that we wanna hear the candidates talk about here today uh, include the lack of affordable housing, displacement of families, teachers, and other school employees, 
mental health and social emotional supports, increasing access to affordable and reliable internet broadband, economic in inequities and workforce preparation, and lastly, the alignment of the various services and supports that the city provides for families and children. So what I, uh, I wanna do next is I wanna bring up a parent and a student who will each share their perspectives and their vision for the next mayor. I wanna start by bringing our very own Communities and Schools of Los Angeles student leader, Kyla Gant. She is a senior at Santee Education Complex, which is right up the street from here. And Kyla's gonna join us now and share her uh, testimony with you all. Please help me welcome Kyla. Hi, <laughs> good evening. <clears throat> Hello, um, my name is Kyla Gant. I'm a senior at Santee Education Complex and I'll be graduating this June and plan on continuing my education at UC Irvine. I am also a student teacher with, sorry, a student leader with Communities and Schools of Los Angeles, an organization that has supported me inside and outside of school. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> sorry, thank you. Um, CISLA has provided me with a mentor and connected me to education, resources like scholarships and tutoring programs. CISLA has also helped black students like myself feel seen and included at school. They have exposed me to new educational opportunities and people that have strengthened my belief that I can and will succeed in education. Coming back to school was tough because we had not engaged with each other for more than a year. It was uncomfortable to interact with one another and difficult to engage with teachers and school staff. I've seen my friends deal with mental health issues like depression and anxiety because they have felt emotionally and physically disconnected during the school shutdown. The pandemic has affected my family, friends, and me in various ways. I'll mention three ways in which the pandemic has impacted us. First, trying to learn from behind the screen was challenging and prevented me from fully comprehending new information and completing assignments to my fullest potential. Second, the amount of learning we lost being out of school is huge, and many of my peers missed out on core academic lessons that we know will certainly impact us in college and beyond. Lastly, school has been difficult since they shut down and we went into virtual learning. We have needed more support to plug back into school. We need more programs like CISLA to help us with social emotional tools and resources that our schools can't always provide. Even though we are back in school, the effects of the pandemic are still impacting students and families. CISLA has definitely made the transition into school easier. After graduating this summer, I'll pursue a major in criminal justice and help the community in some way. The pandemic affected my decision by making me realize that we take time spent in school learning and socializing with people for granted. And having the chance to further your education is an amazing opportunity that many don't have the chance to fully experience. Now that we've gotten the chance to start once again and schools are opening up, I feel that programs like CISLA are going to be needed more than ever to help students like myself discover their passions. Thank you. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to bring up a uh, parent leader. Uh, her name is Maria del Carmen Alonso. She is a parent leader with Alliance for a Better Community. She lives in South Los Angeles and has a son who attends Foshe Learning Center. Bienvenida. And we have a translator too. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Carmen, soy madre líder con ABC y en mi comunidad del sur centro de Los Ángeles. Como alcalde y líder de la ciudad de Los Ángeles, debería asegurar que los jóvenes angelinos se sientan protegidos en su comunidad, la escuela y apoyados en su educación. 
La seguridad en los alrededores de las escuelas deberían ser una prioridad para el alcalde. En los últimos años, los, las banquetas cerca de las escuelas y a veces en las entradas están ocupadas con poblaciones indigentes. Esto pone en peligro a los estudiantes y familias y obstruyen la confianza en las escuelas y la ciudad, haciendo que familias escojan otros distritos escolares. Otra prioridad es preparar a los estudiantes de preparatorias para un futuro próspero. El alcalde debería asegurar que las escuelas tengan suficientes fondos para recursos al acceso a la universidad, incluyendo más ferias de ayuda financiera y becas para los estudiantes, independiente de su estatus migratorio. Como alcalde debería asegurar que la ciudad recauda su subvenciones para invertir en programas como LA College, Promise, Year Up y oportunidades laborales en colaboración con el Distrito Escolar de Los Ángeles y la Ciudad de Los Ángeles. Gracias. Good evening. I'll be interpreting her rendition in English. Good afternoon. My name is Carmen. I am mother and leader with ABC in this, com in this South Central LA community. As a mayor and a leader of the LA City, um, you should ensure that the youth, the Angelino youth, will feel protected in this community and this school is going to have their backs in the education. And the security around the schools should be a priority for the mayor. The previous years, the sidewalks close to the schools and sometimes the entrances have been occupied by homeless. This, puts this, this is a danger to our students and the families and it interrupts the confidence of schools in the city and it makes the families choose different school districts around. Another priority, that the mayor should take uh, and be in charge of uh, for the students is for the uh, students that are in high school to have a better future. The mayor should ensure that schools have sufficient funds for resources and access to universities. This includes uh, fi finances and grants for the students that are independent of the immigration status. As a mayor, uh, the mayor should ensure that the city does fundraise enough grants so that there's uh, programs in LA College Promise and Gear Up and that there are opportunities uh, in the labor force and the collaboration with the district of LA City. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Señora del Carmen. Um, and now we're ready to get this party started. Uh, in order uh, to lead our conversation in the next uh, uh, phase of the program, uh, please welcome our moderator for the night. Uh, we are honored to have Emmy Award winning journalist and CBS2 morning news anchor Suzanne Marquez. Suzanne has conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with First Lady Dr. Jill Biden. Uh, she has done investigative reporting in Atlanta, which led to her first Emmy. She doesn't only have one, she has multiple. Uh, and most re recently led a series called Caring During COVID, which offered support to teens, parents, uh, and frontline workers. She grew up in Downey and got her first taste of journalism as an editor-in-chief in the Rio Grande San Gabriel Elementary School's newspaper. Everybody, please help me welcome Suzanne Marquez. Okay, I'll start up here, but I'll eventually move over there so we can, you know, sit with the candidates. But I'm so honored to be here. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'm Suzanne Marquez, as I just said. I'll be facilitating today's conversations with the candidates. Did my mic go out? Maybe it's because I'm touching it. Okay, so I have an LAUSD kindergartner who has been through all of the challenges that all of the other folks have, but I, I feel like kindergartners, it hasn't been as hard as high schoolers and middle schoolers because, you know, they're five. Uh, but we had to do virtual learning and Zooming from home. Can you imagine? My son was holding up our cats and, you know, I'm sure there was some creative learning happening, but as far as, you know, the ABCs and one, two, threes, you know, that, 
I think that was put off for a little bit, but like I said, having a kindergartner, it's a lot easier, but I've, understand, I've understood the challenges within LAUSD as a mom. Um, Mask-free, um, having a mask on. I've been open on, about this on the air, it's no secret. I got COVID a few weeks ago after they went maskless at school, so the whole class got it. You know, It's been a real challenge because there's a lot of pressure to take off the mask. There's been pressure to keep them on, so I know we're all navigating the same kind of waters and it's been hard on everybody, but it's really exciting that we're here talking to candidates about education because I'm a product of public schools, I grew up here, but I did go to USC, which was a private school and it was absolutely incredible, about 15 minutes from here. As you know, they have some outreach programs, but I think every university needs to do better and I think we can always do better for our kids, especially here in Southern California. So. Let me tell you about how tonight's gonna go. So after much careful thought, the planning sponsors decided that a much more fruitful conversation tonight could be had if we moved away from the structured debate format and instead gave each candidate an opportunity to speak about their education platforms and touch on the key issues that Elmer was talking about earlier. We'll spend 20 minutes to 25 minutes with each candidate tonight and my job will be to facilitate these conversations and ensure that we stay on time and on topic. The format has been decided by the organizers ahead of time with the purpose of hearing the candidates' plans and solutions rather than listening to short talking points. We wanna really dig deep and realize that there are so many issues as we just heard from a parent, we all have these questions. And we look forward to engaging in meaningful conversations tonight. The event sponsors invited all mayoral candidates qualified to appear on the June 2022 ballot and who reached a certain percentage in the UC Berkeley LA Times poll released in February of this year or the LMU poll released in March of this year. The candidates with us today accepted our invitation to participate in today's forum and for the candidates who couldn't make it, we invited them to release a statement and they didn't, they have other commitments. So we are all open tonight. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan event. So we're just excited to dig in. The order in which candidates will be brought up here is LA City Attorney Mike Fuhr, businessman Mel Wilson, and US Congress member Karen Bass. So before we begin with each candidate, we're asking the audience to not clap, no reactions, no cheering, jeering, or displaying any campaign materials. And if you are in attendance, the audience members and candidates that engage in disruptive behavior will be asked to leave. It's a pretty small room, so it'll be pretty obvious if there's disruptions. <laughs> we have a very tight program tonight, so each candidate will be given a one minute warning when their time on stage will expire. So if they need to wrap up any points or if there's something they haven't gotten to, we wanna make sure they can get there. So now we're going to begin the forum with Mr. Mike Fuhr. Let me head on over here and invite Mike to the stage. Make sure our mics are on too. Yeah. Oh, I like the mic swag. Very nice. Okay, great. Okay. So as many people know, Mike Fuhr is currently the LA City Attorney, previously served in the California State Assembly, and was a City of LA Council member. So let's begin, right? Should we just dig in now? All right. So please begin by sharing your vision to support children and youth in LA. And does your current platform include a plan to support and improve our education system? Great, Suzanne, thank you so much. I was saying to Suzanne ahead of time, I feel like I know you, that's because <laughs> when I'm getting dressed in the morning, there nice. you are, but not literally. And, <laughs> right, hope to wake everybody up. Yes, and, and by the way, it is great to be back at a place called home. I've been here a number of times. You are an incredibly impressive facility in a community that desperately needs you. And we'll talk more about those connections in just a second. So I have a lot of views and I'm hoping we can drill deeply tonight just so you know, the candidates were given a set of questions in advance, and I actually seriously said to Suzanne, deviate from them. Let's have this be a real conversation, not a canned one, and I hope we do that tonight. Okay. So a little bit about my background. I was born and raised in San Bernardino, went to public schools there. I grew up there because my father was a teacher and a school principal and a volunteer here at LUSD for 60 years in public schools. So I have a deep feeling for public schools. I have little patience for politicians who talk about public schools, but who send their kids to private schools. My kids are K through 12 LAUSD students. Um, and we're gonna talk about the tether between the city and LAUSD tonight. For those in the audience who don't have a feeling for this, in other cities, mayors have a lot of control over the daily operation of schools. That's not true in LA, but I believe that there should be a very deep relationship between LA city government and public education here, 
including focusing on ties to the school district. Let me talk a little bit about my background for half a second if I could, and then dive into, with some specificity, my thoughts about how I as mayor will interact with the schools. So my background on education, besides what I just described to you. So I won the ACLU's Education Advocacy Award because of my leadership on a case called Williams Against California. That was the most important education equity case in the last generation here. The case, for those of you who are not familiar with it, boils down to this. Low-income kids, typically kids of color, didn't have access to the same quality of teacher, to basic materials like books, and to basic facilities, including bathrooms. Um, I'm very proud of my work on that case. It was resolved for about a billion dollars in the state. I was in the governor's office when we dealt with that issue. Um, on the city council, I felt it was really important to accentuate these ties again. I created a program called Read LA to focus on literacy. That program involved me getting the community colleges, Cal State, the library system in the city together to infuse teachers and training into schools where kids were coming from monolingual Spanish-speaking backgrounds, K through two, to change the student-teacher ratio from 20 to one to about five to one, so they could have that more intimate connection between student and teacher at that very important time. You don't, literacy has to happen at that time to make things work. I was a pioneer in joint use agreements between the city and the school district when it comes to opening up playgrounds for after school activities. I created a program called Shoulder to Shoulder focused on race relations among students, a huge issue to me. Taking middle school students from diverse backgrounds, geographically, ethnically, racially, around Los Angeles, who never would see each other, and pairing them up in teams to do community service projects called Shoulder to Shoulder because my first job in politics was being in charge of issues and research when Mayor Bradley ran for governor. And Mayor Bradley, as you know, was the first African-American governor in the history of the city. And in his administration, he, he purposely populated it with a diverse array of people who enriched the experience of others by working shoulder to shoulder. Both their, the product was important, but learning about each other was important too. I wanted those kids to learn shoulder to shoulder. I made sure that library cards were available for every elementary school student. And now, I see Nick Melvoin here from the school board. So this is probably an important phone call. <laughs> oh, you know, for what it's worth, we have to be good kids as well as good parents and so forth. That was from a location where my, my mom is in a new assisted living facility, and that was them. We're going to do this, then I'm going to call them right back because oh, they don't yeah. usually call me at this hour. Yeah. So um, any, in any event, Again, we have this generational thing happening here. Yes, I, so, I just had my father in an assisted yes, living place. It's, it's a complicated yeah. thing. But going back to the topic at hand, um, when the Parkland tragedy happened, and you recall that was when a gunman went on a rampage at a school in Florida and shot a bunch of kids, um, I convened a panel on school safety here. And I will tell you, and I'll say this to the superintendent, when I called the acting superintendent to say I was going to do that, the reaction boiled down to this. Our schools are safe. It's the neighborhoods that you're in charge of that aren't so safe. And I took that challenge seriously and convened a panel that includes students and teachers and members of, uh, from public safety and psychologists and social workers and architects and gun violence experts. And we heard testimony in eight different community meetings. Hundreds of people weighed in. And as Dick knows, I've come to the school board because we've had 33 concrete recommendations that we'll be discussing tonight because they're relevant here. Um, I also focused on school safety more generally in my office. So a lot of history as mayor, what do I think? So first of all, that safety issue is huge. Safe passages in particular, really important aspiration. I can't understand why we haven't moved with more alacrity on that in the city. Kids bring weapons to school often just to defend themselves on the way to and from school. They won't have those weapons on campus if they don't need them coming to and from campus. We talk about trauma. We should talk about it a lot. As you probably know, the LAUSD doesn't have enough counselors to deal with mental health and other issues. The national standard is one student for, uh, one counselor for 250, 250 students. In LA, it's one counselor for 1,000 students. Not good enough when half of the students at LAUSD come to school traumatized. They're not prepared to learn. We'll talk more about the details of brain science, I hope, tonight in that. I believe we should have an education innovation officer in my administration. 
I was speaking to a major tech executive who was saying, you know, the fact is that the school district trains kids that there's a right and a wrong answer and to come up with those answers independently. In my line of work, we got to work as collaborators together and we don't even know the questions, let alone the answers. I need less certainty and more critical thinking skills. I want to help promote that in my administration. Joint use of school sites I talked about earlier, big deal. Nick and I were talking a second ago, as Nick knows, in Sacramento just this week, an idea I've been promoting for more than a year as a candidate. Let's co-locate affordable housing on school campuses. The bill went through its first committee to make that easier to happen. As mayor, I'm going to focus on that as I have as a candidate because teachers can't afford to live anywhere near where they teach, nor can custodians or clerks in, in school offices. How much better would it be if they're close by? Um, I want to talk tonight about internships. Internships are not an unimportant thing for students looking to find their way to get exposed to work environments and to imagine a whole new world for themselves. But internships in the city are too often relegated to those who have a lot of access to people. So parents like me can call somebody and get an internship for a kid, but a lot of parents in this community don't have access to that. LA 10,000, I'm gonna have 10,000 paid internships for kids, because by the way, that payment piece is really important. If you're expected to contribute to the family income, you can't afford to have a voluntary internship like so many internships are. I wanna talk about trauma in more depth tonight because I think it's an extremely important and under-discussed topic. Social emotional learning is a huge issue on school campuses right now. And we're gonna talk about recovery from the pandemic. Because parenthetically, just to anticipate a question I'm sure gonna get tonight, you know, there's a lot of disagreement in school districts about the degree to which there should be uh, kind of remedial education for kids who missed a year or more because of the pandemic. And I disagree with that. There's a debate about it, and here's where I fall. I think we have to get kids, and this goes to absenteeism as well, which as you know is rampant right now. We gotta get kids inspired to be in school and to think of themselves through the lens of self-esteem and excellence as opposed to remedial education and falling behind. I think we should take kids and continue to have them study as though they hadn't missed that period of time. And for those kids who aren't able to handle it, meet with them in small groups, tutor them, give them special attention, but make every kid realize the standard is high and you can do it and we're gonna help you achieve that, as opposed to your remedial student. Because by the way, that's gonna particularly hit hard people in this community where we are tonight because of the digital divide that we're gonna to discuss tonight as well. Yes. So I, as you can tell Suzanne, I could go on, I got a lot of views about this, but there are views, but for what it's worth, I hope that you hear what I'm trying to share with you. And that is that the mayor of the city needs to be able to talk about homelessness and affordable housing and climate crisis and public education, not with some staff member writing talking points for him or her. The mayor has to have a feeling for these issues in their gut themselves and then move forward to try to translate that vision into reality every day. That's the mayor I'm gonna be. Okay, thank you, Mike. Great introduction. So let's talk about, you said some, you know, some kids are taking weapons to school just because they're scared of how they get there. And we've already heard from one mother talking about homelessness and just children. I, I get scared walking under some overpasses near my home sometimes. I can't imagine what it's like a child walking to school. So one of the solutions would be public services, which the mayor would oversee. How do we make it accessible to all students? Affordable housing, which you touched upon, public transportation like buses, recreations and parks, after school programs, the tutoring you talked about. All of these are wonderful ideas, but how do we make it happen? Well, you know, I recognize that I gave a long opening statement and I know that our time is short, but for what it's worth, I have time. I know there's an next candidate coming in to go as long as you want to, because Suzanne, no asked me, <laughs> Suzanne asked me 26 questions and said respond in a minute to them. <laughs> so, but, but here's the thing. We know, and I was trying to display this as we discussed the, the first question, we know that kids need to come to school prepared to learn. How do we expect a kid living in the substandard housing conditions I'm combated most of my life with rats and roaches and stuff, that kid to come to school ready to learn. What do we do about a kid? It's not enough to have, you know, the kids get food on campuses. Kids need nutritious food at home. If they don't have it, they're not prepared to learn. On the city council years ago, I created a special trust fund for kids not in my council district, for kids in the most underserved communities to expand recreational opportunities after school. If they don't have those opportunities, they're not gonna fulfill their potential either. I mentioned that internship notion that I described mm -hmm. earlier. These are all ingredients. 
as well as the basics in any neighborhood. Safety, access to health care, having parents who are in the home and have jobs, all these elements. There is basically everything that I do as mayor ties into the question that you raised. Every single thing. So for example, to take a kind of prosaic example, you mentioned transportation. So kids take buses to school. When I was in San Bernardino, I rode the public bus to get to school in the morning. If that bus isn't safe, or kids who take the subway or the expo line or other ways to get to school, if those aren't safe, well, that's going to contribute to truancy. And it's going to contribute to carrying weapons to school and so on. So the mayor has to make sure that public transit is safe and clean. The fact is that there would not be a Measure R, which is funding $35 billion for public transit in the city, without me. I authored the law in Sacramento to authorize that bill. But now that we're implementing it as mayor, I have to make sure people want to get on the transit that we're building. Really important. You mentioned affordable housing. We all know the crisis in affordable housing. And by the way, that frames my candidacy. There are multiple crises in this city that are converging right now. Not problems. Homelessness is not a problem. It's an emergency. Affordable housing is not an issue. It's a crisis for us. And we need a mayor, and I intend to be that mayor, and you can tell from the intensity of the way I'm talking here, this is my thing, is someone who comes in with urgency and understands, has a command of the issues, and acts. So Suzanne, I think most productively, given how many questions you asked me, it might be better to break it down in a little bit. If you want to talk about affordable housing, I'll tell you what I think. Homelessness, okay. I'll tell you what I think. Safety, I'll tell you what I think. But otherwise, it's going to be a answer that's okay. going to last for two Why don't we jump in about um, anticipated school closures within LAUSD. The district could lose 40,000 students as people can't afford to live in the city of LA. How do we handle that? Well, there are many reasons for attrition from the school district. And by the way, with the prior superintendent, one of my big things was, in addition to my focus on the most underserved kids, I wanted to find ways to attract middle class parents back into the school district because you gotta have a school district that appeals to a broad swath of the city. That creates a civic infrastructure where you can't ignore what happens on public school sites. So from the standpoint of avoiding school closures, again, let's be really real. There was a study that many of you probably know about that was done very recently that shows that school closures typically happen in African-American communities and, and now increasingly Latino communities given the prevalence of the, the demography of Los Angeles. And there was a study that showed that white parents are less likely to want to go to neighborhoods where the school is principally populated by African-American kids. The mayor has to get the fact that there is some very raw stuff going on when it comes to the selection of schools to close, the reasons that they are closing, gentrification, and race relations. These are all deeply tied together. And can I, do I give you an answer that's a magic wand of an answer to how to deal with closed schools? I cannot, because you know, look, I'm the only candidate running for mayor who's been a public service executive. Now to be clear, I've been a legislator, as many of my competitors have been. Being a legislator requires having an opinion and having a vote. Being an executive, as I am now, and we won the top award in the nation for a public law office for, from the American Bar Association in my office, an executive has to figure out what the priorities are and then assign people to effectuate them and give them time frames and measures of success. My, candidate, my opponents haven't had that, that opportunity to ever do that in the public sector. None of them have. So when I become mayor, I have to figure out what the top priorities are in the universe of things we're talking about and zero in on them. I'm going to every neighborhood in the city as a candidate. There are 101 of them. I was just in one before I came here tonight. Rarely do people ask me questions about education, but they did today. And I'm eager for that dialogue, because you can tell this is a rich conversation. If you hear a candidate say that children are our future or some pablum like that, without any depth to it, then you should vote for somebody else. Because anybody can say that. The question is, well, what do you mean with precision? So Suzanne, let's talk about precise things. OK. I have a, a student within LAUSD, and he was given a computer. And uh, it was wonderful. It's new, it's shiny, it's bright, and there's enough for the whole class. But we obviously have high-speed Wi-Fi. A lot right. of parents, that's a very expensive cost. 
that to me seems like it would go hand in hand. You give the the Wi-Fi code and you would give yep. the computer with it. Otherwise, right. you're just giving you know a book with no words. Right. So we have to look. This is really complicated, right? Because the, the pandemic exposed so many divides and the digital divide was among the most acutely exposed, right? And so look, we have kids who had to go to a neighborhood coffee house or something to try to do their homework because they couldn't do it, but they had a Wi-Fi hotspot there. So first, city libraries have to be hotspots that everybody has access to, for one thing. We should be giving out hotspots to kids in great numbers. We should be saying to the providers of broadband that in order for you to continue to do business in the city, you're going to have to be equitable in your allocation of broadband resources, and that includes where you lay cable, as well as some discounts that are available to people. As we do, for example, you know, the city gives discounts if you're a low-income person for your water and power service. The gas company gives discounts for people for their gas service. Are those utilities any less meaningful to someone in this digital moment than broadband is? I don't think so. And I think it's important for us to find ways to do that. And that may require, I see private sector leaders in this room as well tonight, that's going to require an investment from the private sector to complement public sector investments because the private sector has everything to gain from having kids emerge from public schools educated to have the jobs that they want to provide here. And I, that's one thing I'm going to do as mayor. I'm going to say, look, there's no public-private divide here. We are a team in the city where the private sector needs kids to emerge prepared for jobs. And, and I'll give you a concrete example. My son has an education tech, tech startup. It's in Boston. One reason it's in Boston is not enough engineers trained here. Mm -hmm. You know, I hate that. I just hate it. And we can do better than this. So let's talk about, you touched upon the mental health crisis and there's one counselor for every thousand students. We're ta also talking about closing schools. How do we find the money for that? Well, let me say, the counselor's piece is essential. It is treated as secondary in importance in too many school districts. And that's, as I mentioned earlier, a huge mistake. I wanna dive into brain science just for a second. Kids exposed to gangs and guns and domestic violence and stuff at home on a regular basis will never have their brains develop the way they were biologically intended. And that brain science should compel each of us to say, we are consigning an entire cohort of kids, the same kids who don't have access to decent health care, decent food, decent recreation, their parents often don't have jobs, those same kids are the kids who are going to never be who they could be, right? So that's the imperative that I want Pia and, and at LAUSD, who is in charge of these issues, to rivet herself on. I'm holding a conference next week on the issue of childhood trauma and its relationship to how we deal with the future as city attorney. I will be a relentless advocate with the school district for saying that counseling peace is enormous. I wouldn't say that if 10% of LAUSD kids were traumatized, but when half are, whole different ballgame, friends. And look, resources are an issue. I'm the only candidate running for mayor who's like to be in charge of the city's budget for mm -hmm. the city council. That was one of my jobs. The choices are not going to be easy here. And the city is not going to be able to kick in a lot of money for this. The county typically is in charge of mental health services. But there's a collaboration here. So you were talking about you know, exposure to gangs and violence. There are often students, you know, these are still children. and. Uh, we don't want to over police or criminalize our students either. You know, you talked about black and brown communities and, and it's disproportionately affecting, you know, with gangs. And how do we also support students who are having issues when you have so few resources? And, you know, not just the homeless crisis, but also students who, who need help and they have problems at home and maybe, you know, their, their family can't support them. They're maybe working two jobs or they might be in the prison system. There's so many challenges. The majority of LAUSD is in poverty. Well, you know, when our new superintendent and I sit down when I'm mayor, we're going to be meeting soon and currently, but when I'm mayor, we're going to talk about what the key priorities need to be because any mayor can't do everything all at once, including with schools. We're going to have to say, well, what are the top couple or three things that we should start off with? And it, look, there's a whole array of services and interventions that are going to be necessary in the schools. Many of them are best provided by the county, some by the city, some by the district itself, some by the federal government, many by the private sector. The question is, how do we coalesce all those resources and then hold each other accountable for actually effectuating the goals here? Because look, one of my jobs as mayor is to make sure those neighborhoods are safe. 
And I just, I've been a leader on these issues as I've described. I haven't begun to touch the surface of the school safety measures I've been leading as city attorney because I realize how important it is that the neighborhoods around schools be safe. So that's an imperative. But there are other things I haven't even talked about. You know, and I know our time is very short, but one thing I believe, talking about that private sector jobs school relationship is, we need to be saying to kids, not when they're in high school, way before, let's identify jobs of the future well, a ways out, let's talk to private sector leaders in the key economic sectors of our city, entertainment, the green economy, health sciences, and so forth. Let's bring community colleges, the university and Cal State system, LAUSD, my office together. Let's identify changes in curricula that could lead a kid who is a 12-year-old kid to say, you know what, if I follow this path, I'm going to have a good job, maybe as a cameraman. I'm going to have a good job, maybe as a teacher, whatever it might be. But there should be that alignment of stars so that we anticipate where jobs, not jobs today, where jobs are going to be a few years out, and then get kids or, or oriented towards saying, that could be me. Because yeah. in LAUSD, I know from dealing with, you know, again, I've been a school district parent for many, like 15 years. I know what back to school night looks like. It looks like a handful of parents in high school, right? because very few parents otherwise come. Got a lot of parents, we work two jobs, we work at night, we feel intimidated by a system that doesn't speak the language that I speak. A lot of reasons for not being there. The, the city can find ways to step in and supplement the relationship between student and family. And I'm really eager to deal with that because I get those barriers that every parent, that huge numbers of parents on ASD feel. Because see, part of the thing about being a mayor is to have a sense on the ground of what it means to be a parent struggling to get by every day and provide the basics to my kid and then have to deal with a school administration that may feel remote to them, mm -hmm. right? Especially when teachers have tons of students in their classes. Student-teacher ratios have a lot to do with whether that teacher could actually call a parent knowing how that kid is doing. The district should be tracking every single student in real time to see when they are, if they're on the ball or if they're deficient in something and intervening not a few weeks from now, in real time. And you know, I'm interested in trying to find ways to promote that. What about trade schools? You, you talked about their green economy and they sound wonderful and so does you know, Silicon Valley, but sometimes some of these jobs seem so, like you're gonna be having to go to college forever and not everybody goes to college. My father didn't go to college. And trade schools were something he wanted to see. In fact, my hometown of Downey, they have um, an auto program where you can learn how to work on cars, you can learn how to um, do things that are affiliated with NASA, and just things that are hands-on. What do you think of that kind of approach? So here's what I think. I think that every student should be looked at as a kid who can have any aspiration fulfilled. And we ought to be treating each student that way at every step in the process. But it is, there's nothing wrong with saying to a kid, you know what, if you finish LA Trade Tech, for example, and get a job helping put install solar roofs, that's a decent job with a decent wage if you want to go that path. But we're not gonna consign you to a path, a Trade Tech path, just because you're a kid from this neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? So there's delicacy in figuring out how to do that. But the message needs to be that there's a future for every kid. And the district has to find ways to, 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 to orient kids to the slot that they are going to be most comfortable in. The problem is you don't want to slot any kid too early on, right? Because then you're preordaining the outcome for that student. I like the idea of hope. Is that one minute or is that everything? It's That's over. everything? Okay. <laughs> I didn't even see the one minute warning. I'm so sorry. I haven't asked you any questions yet. <laughs> oh, I, I'm good. I, oh, I already yeah. threw up my, my COVID <laughs> diagnosis, which is far from, I mean, it's very, it's over, over behind me. Yes. But yes, I mean, I'm an open book. Don't worry yeah. about me. I say too much usually. So I was trying to stay on topic with you, but I'm, I'm really glad that we approach these questions. Every candidate has the same opportunity to answer the questions. And thank you for sharing your, your path and your history and all of your connections as well. So as, as we conclude here first, I want to thank everybody again for the opportunity. Those of you who haven't had a chance to ask questions, I encourage you to find me. My cell phone number for the campaign purpose is 310-367-9558 if you want to write it down. You can call me and engage on these issues because, look, you can run a campaign with a bunch of gauzy TV ads that never require you to engage with people in the community 
or you can engage with people in real life, in real ways, in the community. I think that speaking skills, I can speak, but those are overvalued. Listening skills are way undervalued. We didn't have a chance to have me listen to the group tonight. I want to keep that opportunity going. Come to my Meet Mike Every Neighborhood meetings if you want to. Ask me anything. But we have six weeks left in the campaign uh, before the primary election. I want to learn from you even as I advocate for you. Because I have a sense of passion about this. I hope you'll join me. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike Fjord. Right, thank you so much. Good to see you. Thank you. All right, now we'd like to introduce another candidate to the stage. Mel Wilson is a business owner and previously served on the board of Metro. We'd like to welcome Mel to the stage. I think he's back here. Okay, here he comes. I'll come right over here. Hi, Mel. How are you? Nice to see you. I love your kicks. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Come on over here. Buddy. Before I get started, okay. I want to take a picture of all you beautiful people. Okay. So I'll hang on. Up. Let me get my camera ready, and then, and then I'll be ready to go. Hang on. Okay. Smile. Queso, queso. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your patience. Okay, thank you. Okay, now I know where to look. I'm sorry, you can do that too. Oh no, that's great. <laughs> I think it's, I, trust me, I would have already done it. My husband's in the audience taking <laughs> Which photos. Which one is he? He's right there in the corner. <laughs> He's a product of Burbank schools. Well, I'm, I'm a product of the LA Unified School District. Well, my son is becoming one too. He's a kindergartner. So Mel, Let's just you know, get right to it, and let's talk about, would you like to do an introduction, or would you like I me would, to jump I right would. in? Okay, okay. Uh, does anyone know what uh, su casa mi casa? Yes. <laughs> this is my house now. <laughs> I'm Mel Wilson, and I, uh, I went to public schools, uh, O'Melveny Elementary School in San Fernando, San Fernando Junior High, San Fernando High School, Cal State Northridge, uh, and many years later, about six years ago, I got my master's degree from Columbia College. Not Columbia University, but Columbia College. And so um, I, I was a business major at Cal State Northridge, a CSUN, uh, all-American football player, played professional football for a short while. And then I got into business in my hometown of beautiful downtown Pacoima. Anybody been to Pacoima? Of course, yeah. That's my hood, that's where my homies are. And I was a lowrider as a kid. I was a kid that was at risk. I was raised by my single mother and my single grandmother. My mother and my grandmother cleaned houses for $5, I'm sorry, $12 a day. So we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, and I believe in public school systems. I believe in LA Unified School System. And I believe it needs help right now. And I know as mayor, I can be a collaborative partner with the LA Unified School Districts. Uh, because uh, there was a time when I was a kid in junior high, I was inspired by a person in the private sector. He came onto campus for a career day and he was a CPA and I didn't know what the heck that was. I was just a poor kid, you know, trying to figure it out. And I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm a CPA. I said, what's that? He says, I'm a certified public accountant. I said, so what's your job? He says, I count money. I said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so it inspired me to go to college to get a business degree uh, at Cal State Northridge. I was an accounting and a management major. And I've had a great experience. Uh, I believe in collaboration. I believe in uh, coalitions. Superintendent, welcome to LA. Uh, I believe in uh, uh, co collaboration and um, coalition building. I believe in excellence and I believe in public schools. There you are. Thank That's you. That's great. My husband is a CSUN graduate as well. Bam! <laughs> Matador. <laughs> Matadors, exactly. Okay, so let's start about talking about your vision to support children. And does your current platform include a plan to support and improve the system that you're saying needs help? I mean, the majority of all of our students live in poverty, 
and we're losing students every year. Yeah. Well, uh, I invite you to go to my website. It's really simple, melformayor.com, melformayor.com. And the four is the number four, formayor.com. And it talks about what I want to do to make our city a better city. Um, number one is we have to make our city safe. I grew up in Pacoima, I was a low rider, so I know about police abuse. You know, when you're riding around your 57 Chevy with the big old afro, you know, you could be a target. And so I wanna make sure that we make our city safe by hiring more police officers, but my plan is called an accountable community policing plan. Holding people accountable. Holding the cops accountable, holding the people who are breaking the laws accountable, but engaging the community. I believe that the community should decide how they want to be policed. They should be a part of the policing plan. And so what I want to do is help families. My website talks about what I will do, which helped me get through difficult times. Uh, I had a part-time job when I was 16 years old, and I was able to buy that 57 Chevy by myself. Mm -hmm. I was also able to help my mother and my grandmother pay some of the bills. So they didn't have to pay for my school supplies, my yearbook, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, I, my plan, if you read my website, it talks about me hiring 75,000 young people, part-time, maximum 16 hours a week, high school and college age kids. And at the end of the semester, they stayed on that job and they've completed the semester work. And I'm not saying you have to get a B or A or whatever, just complete whatever you have to complete to get through that semester and get a passing grade. You get a bonus. You get a bonus of $3 an hour for whatever number of hours you worked. This is gonna incentivize young people to go to school, but also to stay on that job, even if they don't like the jefe or the jefa. <laughs> They're gonna stay on that job because they know the dinero is gonna be in their pockets. So that's what I wanna do. I also wanna help young people with their families by giving child care subsidies. This is a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, it costs $1,000 to $1,250 a month per child. That's a lot of money. If you're making 3,000 a month and you're paying $2,500 a month for childcare, you might as well not go to work, right? And so I'm gonna help young people and their families by subsidizing the childcare. The less you make, the more you get subsidized. And that's how it would work. So as far as you know, helping other people, what I wanna do is make the city of LA a partner with the school district. And here's how we do this. What we do is we, we share facilities. We share the parks, share the school grounds, and it has to be orderly done, you know, negotiated between the schools and the city. We make our city safe, we also make our parks safe, and we make our schools safe. All of us working together. I don't believe in over-policing, but I also believe that we have to have safe havens where there's good lighting around schools, mm -hmm. where there's parks that you can play and hang out at, not just asphalt. We need to have fun, because you might know I like to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> so let's talk about just the accessibility to getting to and from school, transportation, and also you know just walking around town as an adult can be scary. Yeah. Like you said, the lack of lighting and the the homeless crisis, especially in this area in particular, you know, just a block or two away, it's yeah. it's unsafe to walk as a child. It's unsafe to walk as a child. It's unsafe to walk as an adult. Uh, it really is, and that's why we need to up our game with community public safety. I wanna hire more police officers, but also hire community people, because they know who the people are. They know the troublemakers, and so if you hire people from the community, take some of that policing money, hiring young people, hiring older people who are maybe retired to kind of watch out what's going on, that's gonna help our communities become safer. Uh, and regarding getting to school, I was a board member on Metro. Anybody know what Metro is? <laughs> I used to ride the bus. Anybody here ride the bus? Come on, you know times, you rode the bus. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I wanna make Metro free for students. Did you hear me? It should be free because there are a lot of families that do not have the resources. Many families don't have a car. So we need to make it easier for children to get back and forth from school, but also adults. There are a lot of adults who are going to school, trying to up their game, getting better skills so they can get jobs to pay them better pay. So that's what I'm gonna do as a collaborative effort, just working with the community, 
working with the school district and working with my administration and all the departments that are within the city of Los Angeles. I know we've done stories on free rides for students and it's usually temporary. What, what is holding it back from it being permanent? Well, what's holding it back is Metro. Here's how it works at Metro. Metro has 13 members. The mayor has four of those members. Anybody know basic arithmetic? The majority on a 13 board member is seven. The mayor starts out with four. I know how to negotiate. I know how to build bridges. So all I have to do is really get the other, three other people really to say yes. And it gets done. And then you get a free ride as a student. And let's talk about the accessibility. I talked about it earlier with Mike, but I'm gonna act like I didn't because we're talking to you. Thank you. So a lot of students get computers to take home when they were doing virtual learning, but there's no access to Wi-Fi or, you know, if you're six or seven, you're not gonna go to Starbucks on your own to find a hotspot. How do we get service providers or the city or somebody to pay or make it accessible for kids to be able to use their computers at home? Well, the reality is that in some communities, like my community of Pacoima, there's not one Starbucks, not one. So it's not like Starbucks is on every corner. So here's how we make this work. We found out during COVID that there's so many inequities in our society and especially here in LA. I have volunteered with a group called the Youth uh, uh, Conference. It's a, it's a young men youth conference, right? Uh, Dr. Brenda Manuel, you'll get to know her. Dr. Joyce Watts, you'll get to know her. Dr. Uh, Lorena Franco, you should know her. These are folks who are involved in these programs to help young people. I'm involved with a program called the Village Nation, Fluke Flukers, and Dr. Joyce Watts, all of them. And so what we need to do is we need to go to the franchise contractors. We have Spectrum, we have AT&T, and here's what we do. I'm a business guy. I know how to negotiate, okay? And here's what we do, we say, look, you want access to the four million people in Los Angeles? You have to provide broadband at the lowest price. I don't mean like $20 a month or some crazy number where people cannot afford, for everybody. Did you hear me? Now if you wanna get the super speed, oh, you pay a little more. But everyone should have access. I did these uh, workshops, working with these young men at risk, mostly men of color. They were in junior high and high school, and many of them were stressing out. They were like, you know, my Wi-Fi, I don't have Wi-Fi, I can't do my, my work. So we have to make it available for everyone, because it's just not fair for the rich to have access and everybody else not. And that's what we have to do. We tell these contractors, Spectrum and the others, if you want to have access to the rest of them, you got to make a deal for everybody. That's it. And because of issues like that, because of people losing family members to COVID, because of job loss, which could be chronic, but made worse by the pandemic, a lot of kids are dealing with mental health issues, as so many adults are as well, but it's especially hard on kids. How do we support them? Well, you know, uh, as I go around our city from Watts to uh, Boyle Heights, to Jefferson Park, to uh, West Adams, to Woodland Hills, to Pacoima, all over the city, I'm talking to young people, and here's what they're telling me. I'm stressed out. I feel anxiety. I feel there's no hope. You know, I'm thinking about maybe I shouldn't be here anymore. There's so many kids at risk thinking about committing suicide. And so my plan is to not only hire those police officers, but to hire 350 mental health experts. They'll be accessible to the police to intervene, but they're gonna be much more accessible to you, your kids, your grandparents, your parents, everyone needs help. And for a long time, no one talked about mental illness. It was like a dirty little secret. But guess what? When you see kids committing suicide, it breaks your heart. And many times there are warning signs. But you as a parent, you say, oh, mijo, mijo, you don't wanna kill yourself. You don't take it serious, but they're serious. And if they have mental health experts to help them get through these traumas, they'll be able to make it. And that's what we do. We have to put our money 
where our people are at, and that is hiring 350 mental health experts, making them accessible. And you don't have the health insurance to do it. You, it should just be available to you, period. That's it. So why do you think the city's having such an issue solving these issues where we're, I mean, obviously the cost of housing is out of control and people are having to move out of LA. We could face school closures, losing so many students. How, why do you think these problems haven't been solved? Well, um, some of you know, comprar su casa, vender, no? Anybody buy a house, sell a house, renta? That's what I do. 40 años, 40 years I'm working selling houses. And I went back to school, as I told you, six years ago. I was 63 years old, 63 años, about me, okay? I got my master's degree, and I got it on how do you create housing that's affordable for middle-income workers and poor people and millennials in Los Angeles. And here's what the problem has been. We have all these people who've been in office, some of them, one was here before, you got two more coming, maybe. They've all been in office for years, and they're going to come here and tell you all the stuff that they're going to do. And you ask them, I'm going to give you a report card. What did you do before? What did you do on homelessness? What did you do on jobs? What did you do for our kids? And we'll see. Ask them, how do you grade yourself on those? That's what you all should ask them. Preguntas? Ask them, what did they do? What grade did they give themselves? And so what I'm saying is this. They've had the chance. They have not done it. When I played professional football, I had the chance. But guess what? If you don't do the job, you're gone. And that's what we should do to these people. We should say, vamanos, go, because you don't do your job. And so what I'm saying here really is that I know how to create housing that's affordable for many years. Thank you. For many years, I've sold hundreds of homes to first-time buyers. Many of them look like you. 35% of my clients are Spanish-speaking. I don't speak Spanish. I speak Spanglish. Can you tell? <laughs> Spanglish. <laughs> but I grew up in, in the hood in Pacoima. All my friends were Chicanos. You guys yeah. are too, too young to know what that is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay? That's what I did. And so what I'm saying is that I can create housing that's affordable. I know how to give a person a 1% down payment. And the city of LA I used to have a program, and I'm going to put it on steroids. We're going to help 15,000 families with 1% down, and the city's going to come up with 20% and you're gonna own 80% of that house. So the equity that's going up, it's gonna be yours. You give the city its 20% back when you pay off the loan or when you sell it, and that's gonna help it more affordable. And we're gonna build housing, and we're gonna build apartments, and we're gonna tell the builders, we're gonna lower the fees. The city is charging $60,000 for one unit. So what if we tell the city, we're gonna waive the fees, but you have to build houses for the people in this room? If you don't, you, you still pay the fee. And you know what? People who are business people, they like money too. So if you make it easy for them, you tell them what you want to do, they do it. I've been traveling lately to other states, and I see so much new construction that seems to be affordable housing. All the new construction I see here seems to be luxury apartments or condos or mixed use, which are fantastic if you can afford it. But it's mostly gentrification, which is great if you have the money. But yeah. We're hearing outlandish prices for small homes. Or how? What do you think the city's been getting wrong all this time? Well, you know, they keep passing laws that makes it hard for the construction industry to build. And I want to roll back some of those laws. Some of those laws are, are the fees that I'm telling you about. They just passed a fee about four years ago called the Affordable Housing Linkage Fee. Really? <laughs> all they did was make it easier for rich people to buy. Not for my clients. My clients are not rich people. They're everyday people. We put together two and three families to buy one house, but we get it done. And so what we have to do is we have to have people who are visionaries and who have experience in housing. That's my experience, transportation and housing. I know how to do this. Go to my website. You'll see what I'm talking about. But it's, it, it can be done today, not three years, not 10 years away from now, right now, even with these crazy high prices. And and you talked about more police for <laughs> seven, seven minutes. minutes. Okay. And you tell me if you want to, you know, wrap it up too. I'm just going down our list of questions that I'm asking all I the candidates. I want to be here all night with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and let's talk about over policing and and the the fear of police and also not just for you know 
black kids, brown kids, also fears of ICE, people not wanting to participate in the census, which hurts communities. How does the mayor reach out and get more people on board and, and reestablish trust? Well, the mayor has to just keep it real. You, can you tell I keep it real? You don't think so? Do you think I keep it real? I keep it real. So the mayor has to be out there talking to the community, not just showing up like you know once every 10 years or four years or whatever they do now. So we have to keep it real and let people know that I've, I've been in the same place that you're in. I was very poor and I was an angry kid, but I worked my way into the middle class, but I got my education, public education. And we know the schools are losing kids like crazy. They're losing kids. Only 5% or 6% of the LA Unified School District are people that are black like me. What happened? Used to be a lot more. The good kids with, well, I shouldn't say good kids, the kids with the, with the good talents, arts talent, sports talent, they're being picked off by all these private schools, right? And so then you have all the schools left with the kids who are really are, don't have all the privileges to learn. And so what we have to do as a mayor is you have to bring people together. You have to tell the example. I have an amazing story. When people read my story, they're like, wow. And they say, wow, that's amazing. And I say, you know what? That's a God thing. God got me through this. And that's, that's what I tell people. So we have to be visible. We have to hold police officers accountable. When they break the law, we prosecute them. We can't let them get off. We cannot. Because guess what? You break the law, they're going to prosecute you. So it needs to be fair. So when they mess up, we, we lock them up. That's it. And let's talk about the learning loss that's happened for so many students. Because, you know, two years of a pandemic, they just missed out on so much. There's only so much you can do remotely. What role should the mayor play in tandem with LUSD? Well, the mayor needs to be a collaborator. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're going to be my, my best friend. <laughs> the mayor needs to be a collaborator. The mayor needs to work with LA Unified. You know, uh, uh, Superintendent, I don't know you personally, but everything I've heard about you from people who work here is good. They're all saying you're good. So I'm thankful that we have somebody who knows how to run a big organization who cares about the kids. I've heard it from school teachers at local schools and the like. And so um, the mayor has to be a collaborator, collaborator with you. I don't want your job. LA is a big enough problem without me trying to get your job. But I want to help you with your job. I want to make our schools safer. I want to give our kids equity. I want to have training for kids. I want us to bring back, think about this. My tío and my primos, they went to auto shop. They went to electric shop. They are electricians and auto mechanics. That's good working, good paying jobs that you can't import out. So let's think about figuring out a way to collaborate with the skill centers and others and get my cousins who did not go to college, my, my, my uncles, they didn't go to college but they have good paying jobs and it's respectable. At Metro, we're hiring mechanics, we're hiring bus drivers. These are good paying jobs, plumbers, electricians. And so the mayor has to be a part of this. I can't tell you how to run your organization and you could tell me how to run mine and I'll listen to you, but then I'll, you know, I'll listen to other people too. <laughs> so uh, what I'm saying is that we have to work together collaboratively. Here's the this, this secret sauce. It's called the public sector the private sector, the nonprofits, and the faith communities. Did you all hear me? Public, private, nonprofit, faith. And I'm not telling you what faith. We all can work together. When we work together, we'll solve some of these really complex problems that LA has. And I, you know, I've thought this through. I, I have a vision of a, a better LA. I cannot do it by myself. I'm the underdog. But guess what? I was a kid that was an infant mortality risk. I was born in a house, not a hospital. I grew up never knowing my father. I was an at-risk kid. I went to Cal State Northridge. I played football. I played a different position every year, and I made All-American. I beat the odds. I've been on the Metro Board, the Fire Commission, all these different commissions. I never asked for one. People sought me out because they say, Mel Wilson's honest. He has integrity. He works hard. He's a team player. Mel Wilson gets the job done. And that's what I'm asking you to do. Take a look at my website, melformayor.com. I will work hard for you. I believe in you. Help me help you. 
I like that you touched upon that there are other options for, uh, college is wonderful for a lot of people, but if you don't see it for your future or you, maybe you're not ready yet, I feel like a lot of kids, they just give up and that's why you see the dropout rate and that's why you see kids just, you know, not going and pursuing any sort of yeah further education. So how do we involve the local businesses with, with that? Well, I am a, a living proof of how a local business inspired this kid, this at-risk kid, angry kid, to go to school. I had great teachers. Uh, you know, when I was a first grader, I fell in love with my first grade teacher, so I love school ever <laughs> since, okay? <laughs> but I have teachers on the way. My, my high school teachers, Mrs. Langton, uh, typing. I got to work with her years later as an instructional aide, being her assistant. When I was in her typing class, she used to hit my fingers like, don't watch those keys, Melvin. And so I later got to work with her, and I realized she wasn't mean. She just meant what she said, <laughs> you know? She wasn't mean. And I learned how to type 65 words a minute. And then I had another teacher. He was a PhD in history, my wrestling coach, Mr. Samuel D. John. Look him up, Samuel D. John. He taught me to work hard. My surrogate father, one of my surrogate fathers, a guy named Howard Marcus, taught in San Fernando High School, and then he was teaching all the extended care with the young ladies who were pregnant. He and I are still friends today. I love the man, Howard Marcus. Go to my website, melformare.com, uh, and you'll check him out. All I'm saying is this. I, my heart, my, como say, my, 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 Corazón grande <laughs> para mí. That's me. I'm going to work hard for you. Trabajando duro. That's me. So I'm asking you to help me help you. I'm motivated. I have the experience. No one else has had three different mayors trust them like I have. I can get this job done. It's a tough job. I can't do it by myself. But I'm in the right place. I'm with the community that cares. I need your help. Go to my website, melformair.com. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mel. Thank you. Really nice talking to you. Thank you so much. You. Nice to Thank meet you. you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to give folks about five minutes so you can stretch, yeah. and then we'll bring up our next candidate. Next, we have Karen Bass. So don't go too far, anybody. Ladies and gentlemen, if we can take our seats, please. We'll begin, we'll resume our program shortly.
Ladies and gentlemen, if I can have you take your seats, please. We will resume our program. It's great to see everyone saying hello, stretching their legs, but we're going to resume our program. If I can please have you take your seats, please. Okay, we're just checking the mics are all back. We just want to let everybody know we're going to kick things off with our final candidate of the evening. We're so excited. Karen Bass is here, currently serving as a U.S. Congress member representing L.A.'s 37th District, previously served in the California State Assembly, and was a founding member and executive director of a nonprofit organization here in L.A. Karen, thank you so much for joining us, and would you like to open with some words or a statement, or do you want to dive right in? Well, we can dive right in, but let me just say thank you so much for inviting me, and it's very nice to be here at a place called home. I remember when the organization started, so to see how it's grown is very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're thrilled to have you back. So let's just jump in about your vision for the youth of LA. Does your current platform include a plan to support and improve our education system? Well, um, my platform does include that, and uh, what my focus and my concern is, you know, everybody knows the role of the mayor, what the mayor can and can't do education-wise, but um, I am very concerned about what we all experienced in the pandemic. And then just personally, you know, I watched my seven-year-old grandson and my 12-year-old grandson, my 12-year-old grandson uh, is special needs, he's autistic, and the seven-year-old, and to try to do remote learning with a seven-year-old, I did watch the class one day and watch them kind of all over the place because how you gonna have a seven-year-old gonna sit there in front of the screen? So it left me deeply concerned about what has happened over the last, now going into the third year. And so wanting to see what I could do to support that and to support the gap. But I'll tell you, one of the biggest concerns I have is the mental health piece and uh, really want to look at bringing additional resources in for mental health. And then I'm a big proponent of peer support, and so obviously in the higher grades, in middle school and in high school, training young people so that they can identify when their peers have problems. Because I would love to say that there'd be 10 counselors in each school, but we know that that's not exactly realistic. Mm -hmm. But we can look for funding, federal funding, to increase the number of counselors that are in school, but I would also like to focus on the peer support model. And I have a kindergartner within LAUSD, and I was telling everybody that he would show off his toys and his cats. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's very hard to rein them in from home, so I know it took a toll on everybody. I, I, I tell you, I really empathize for the teachers. Yes. Who were trying to keep the kids focused, <laughs> but how do you keep a kid, you know, that's yeah. not watching cartoons? Exactly. Focused keep on them engaged and learning. It's hard enough. Exactly. So let's talk about the city services. Um, a parent tonight expressed concern about just getting to school. Right. Um, sometimes, you know, they don't have access to streets that are clean or safe. They, they've talked about problems with homelessness. Do you ha think that there are ways that we can address safety at schools, getting to and from school, within schools as well? Well, absolutely, safe passage programs for sure. And in my plan for public safety, I have a couple of components. 
One is just how you deal with crime, but the other, which is where I want to put the bulk of my efforts, which is on prevention, prevention and intervention. And so we do know what works. We do know how to keep kids from getting involved in gangs. We do know how to keep kids from getting involved in crime. And I'm also a big proponent in after school programs because we as a society act like childcare ends at about fifth grade. Now granted, when you're in middle school and high school, you don't call it childcare, we'll call it after school programs. But you know, if you look at delinquency, if you look at teenage pregnancy, you know when youth are at increased risk for both of those. It's from three to seven o'clock before parents get home. And so I will be a big proponent of after school programs as well. You know, LA's Best is a program that has been supported by the mayor's office for a long time. I would support that, but I also think more needs to be done, especially in the higher grades. And how do we find the funding when, you, when we're looking at losing students because people can't afford to live in LA, they're having to move out of the area, and just the high rates of poverty, people can't afford to live here, uh, there's so, we have the a very high poverty level within LAUSD in general? So, so let me ask, answer the um, uh, first question in terms of where you get the money. I mean, I am a big believer in this is the United States of America, this is LA, there is money. One of the things that I found a couple of years ago uh, that I was pretty surprised by is that the mayor's office does not, does not have an entity, a department, or staff that are dedicated to look for money. So one thing that I want to do is have a development department, now maybe it'd be in the CAO's office, I'm, I'm not sure where it would be, but I want to hire dedicated staff who do nothing but look for money. So Lucille Roybal Allard, who I believe represents uh, this area, a uh, very good uh, colleague and mentor to me, serves on appropriations, and we were having, our districts are right next to each other, and we were having some uh, issues, and um, look, as an appropriator, she went back and saw that LA leaves millions of dollars on the table, doesn't even apply for. And so I will look for money, because I don't subscribe to the idea that all of the money from the city comes from the city budget. I want to look for additional money to come in. And I think that this, this is key. Prevention, especially when you're working with young people, uh, and bring in additional dollars in that way. And then in terms of poverty, I mean, we have to address, I mean, I do believe that one of the greatest issues in our city is profound income inequality. And the only way to address income inequality is better and higher paying jobs. I mean, we fought a few years ago for a $15 an hour wage increase, you remember that? Mm -hmm. Who can survive on $15 an hour? Mm -hmm. Nobody can, not in this city. And so there's only three types of jobs. You're either self-employed, you work for the private sector or the public sector. And I want to focus on jobs and high paying jobs. And one way, one area that I want to focus on is climate change. Because I think as we move forward to our goals of 100% renewable uh, in the next 20 plus years, that's an opportunity for jobs. It's also an opportunity for uh, small business development. So I was in Sacramento when we passed the first climate change bill. And, um, and I know I certainly didn't think about it, and I'm not sure if anybody else did, but a whole bunch of millionaires were created from that, from that legislation. As we move to renewables, green buildings, all of the things that you need to do to address climate change, that would be a wonderful partnership with schools so that schools and young people can learn that that's a whole new area where people can work once they finish school, and then also, of course, you know, for the parents. So looking at higher paying jobs, uh, and then, you know, I believe that the, the worst manifestation of the profound income inequality is 40 plus thousand people living in tents. Yes, it's heartbreaking, and uh, when you think about adults just having to see that, you, children being surrounded by that, it can really... Well, how about children living in those tents? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and being at the mission and seeing families lining up for Easter or Christmas, it is absolutely devastating. So what role do you think the mayor plays with LAUSD? Well, I mean, I think that, that the mayor, first of all, has the bully pulpit. Um, I think, you know, you can look at the mayor's job and people say, well, it's a weak mayor in the city. I think the job is what you make it. Uh, one, I would want to have a very close partnership. I was happy to meet our new superintendent, who I've welcomed to our city. Mm -hmm. And I would like to have a very close relationship with the superintendent, with the board, with the teachers, the unions, the parents. Uh, and I love the idea of community schools. And so the schools that are in our community, how do we turn them into centers? that function beyond three o'clock, 
but that takes extra resources. So to me, the partnership would be a financial one. I wouldn't just look to you to say, this is what I think you need to do, but I would want to come to the table with the resources to make it happen. And having a child in LAUSD who is given a computer and we can afford Wi-Fi, high-speed Wi-Fi. So many parents, especially if they're you know, living in a shared apartment or on the streets, however they're struggling, especially if they're making $15 an hour, don't have a job, can't afford Wi-Fi, what do you think we should do to try and get it to students? Well, well, first of all, we have to figure out how we subsidize it. Because it's one thing, I mean, you know, in some of the rural areas, they don't have the access because broadband's not there. We have it here. You just can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to figure out the subsidies. But you know what? It's not just enough to have Wi-Fi. I mean, going back to the experience of the pandemic and, and my seven-year-old, well, you know, it was great. I was there with him. But uh, we make an assumption that the parents mm -hmm. would know how to use it. I understand after you reach a certain age, you can assume that young people know how to use it. But what about elementary school yeah. kids? So I think there's more to it than just making sure that people can afford it. People also have to have access and training and, and know how to use it. But therein, I would go back to community schools to say, after work in the evening, come and bring the laptop and we can show you how to use it so that you can help you know, your kids. So more outreach for parents as well. Well, more, more outreach, um, the availability, but also the money. And what do you think is the biggest issue facing our schools right now? Well, I mean, I think, you know, uh, again, the economy, uh, poverty, as you mentioned, um, it is huge. And I remember in, in LA Unified, um, Elmer, you remember this, <laughs> Elmer Rodan, um, when it was overcrowding and we had year-round schools. And then we waged big battles in the organization that Elmer and I were in, Community Coalition, to fight for schools to be built. Mm -hmm. Now we have the schools yeah. and we're losing the students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I wanna know is where'd they go? I where'd know. they go? That's, I wonder, are they moving out to other counties because well, of affordability I mean, I know we've or do you lost, think they're staying I, home? I know we've lost some people, mm -hmm. but not as many as is reflected in, in the attendance that has dropped. And I'm sure there's some that are homeschooled, but I don't know, and I, I don't want to make the assumption, but um, I'm assuming somebody is studying to figure out where all the children went. Yes, you hope it's not just, you know, having to work. I mean, that was something my father faced when he was young and, and poor. He had to go to work for his family because the parents were having yeah, hard... but elementary school kids aren't working. Yeah, not, not elementary. So, I mean, maybe they're at home because of child care. You know, it could mm -hmm. be. And I do know that some parents are reluctant to send their kids uh, to school because of, pandemic. you know, yeah, be, because of the pandemic. Were you a timekeeper? I'm sorry, because I'm not even paying attention to the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. they'll, they'll hold up a good card. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you were talking about the concern over the mental health crisis with students as well. How, how do we address that? Because like you said, we, we can't have 10 counselors in a school. No, but you can have a counselor that can train students to do peer counseling. And, and I don't mean, you know, the students are going to do therapy, but you can train uh, students to identify um, one of their classmates that might be depressed, one of their classmates that might be online saying things or doing mm -hmm. things. And, um, and, and I know that you can do that. You can teach kids how to do that. You can also set up peer support groups. So there's ways to uh, do this. There's models to do this. And it's a good leadership program, mm -hmm. by the way, for kids. Yes, it probably gives them you know, more of a connection, too, that's assisted at school. Why do you think homelessness has not been solved or it hasn't even been helped? It seems to be getting worse and worse. Well, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> I mean, I believe because uh, I don't think that our city or our county has really viewed this as a problem to be solved. And, and I, I draw an analogy because in another life I worked in the medical field like with a chronic disease, you know, um, you guys are all young, but if you have something like high blood pressure or diabetes, you don't expect for it to be cured. You know you're gonna be taking medicine for the rest of your life. And I kind of feel that that's how we approached homelessness, and then it exploded, because we were working on this issue <laughs> for decades. And, uh, but it's, it's really gotten completely out of control, because I don't think that we ever really tried to solve it, and then at the same time, LA has become some, so unaffordable. LA wasn't always so unaffordable. It used to be a very affordable place to live. What we focused on in the last couple of decades is building luxury stuff, 
but not really paying attention to affordable. And then when people talk about affordable housing, I always wonder, affordable to who? Yes. Is it affordable to people that make $15 an hour? I don't know. Yes, every, I was saying earlier to one of the other candidates that everything going up seems to be luxury or mixed use and very aspirational instead of realistic. So do you think that laws need to change? Uh, you talked about finding the money for things. I think that, you know, and, and my other colleagues that are running also feel we need to declare a state of emergency. Uh, but I don't think a local state of emergency is enough. I think it needs to be a federal state of emergency as well. Uh, when you declare, but to me, if you have a natural disaster, you don't sit around and mess around. You immediately go into action and you have to relax rules and regulations. You have to do whatever it takes to get the job done. That's not the spirit, the attitude, uh, or the leadership that we have displayed in this area on this issue. How do you think the pandemic and you know mask mandates are flipping right now, how do you think that'll play into um, when you become mayor? Do you think that's going to be a big priority still? Well, I, I think so in terms of the pandemic that never seems to end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. And, and, and the focus that I hope I don't have to have because, you know, the new mayor doesn't take over for quite a while. I hope by then we have many more people vaccinated. So to me, that needs to be our focus. And it needs to be done on a grassroots level with trusted messengers to go literally door to door where it's needed. I mean, you know, the communities that are under vaccinated are the black and brown communities. And we need to focus on that. Uh, but the other thing that I would do if I have an opportunity to serve as mayor is plan for the next pandemic. I mean, this caught all of us by surprise. I mean, even though I had a medical background, I was just shocked at what we were all going through. And it's really deep to think that the entire planet went through the same thing at the same time. I have 10 more minutes now, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so when we, you know, what they've been talking about as an endemic, right? So, but we have so many problems as a city you're talking about homelessness, we're talking about building more infrastructure and more housing for families. What do you think would be your first priority? Well, first of all, they're all interconnected. But the first priority has got to be the 40 plus thousand people on the street, and many of whom die every day. I mean, we lost 1,500 people in 2020, and I think the number was around 2,000 last year. They're dying on our streets in Los Angeles. That's insanity. I mean, 70% of the people in those tents are black and brown. And when you go to the neighbor, I mean, we're, it's not far from here. Oh, yeah, Skid I know. Row. Right. It's, you don't need to go to Skid Row. You can go down the mm -hmm. street. Oh, yeah, right around the corner. I mean, most neighborhoods are seeing homelessness as well. You know, areas that I've, I've grown up here since the 70s, and I've never seen it like this, ever. That's because it never was like yes, this. Yes, that's why. It's just, that's, I feel We've like. We've raised an entire generation that thinks that this is the way it is. And if you're old enough, you remember that it wasn't like this before. We didn't even use the word homelessness. Yeah. That word came into the vernacular in, in, uh, in the 80s. That's why it's, you know, traveling to other cities, they just, nobody compares. New York right. used to <laughs> seem more, more seedy or more, you know, dangerous or more of a concern. Now it just is sad when you drive down the freeways or near the underpasses. I don't walk alone near an underpass anymore because you know, there's sweeps and things. So clearly the approach isn't working. What do you think would be the solution? Is it mental health services? Is it moving around well, money? Well, we, we have to, one, get people off the street as soon as possible. And then we have to address why they're unhoused. So what I worry about, especially in political campaigns, I worry that the people who are unhoused are being viewed as a monolith. You know, they're drug addicts. They don't want to get off the street. That's the way it is. Though they are different sectors that are there. There are people who are there for sheer economic reasons. There are veterans. There's people who were formerly incarcerated that were released and people didn't pay attention to wh where they were gonna go afterwards. There are former foster youth. When they turn 18, we just kick them to the curb. There are people who are suffering from chronic diseases, including, but not exclusively, substance abuse and mental illness. And so you have to get people off the streets in temporary housing, but we have to come up with a new model of shelter because the idea of you just put a bunch of cots in a room makes no sense anymore. And now for health reasons, you can't do that. So we, and then we have to have permanent supportive housing for those people that need permanent supportive housing. Some people just need a house. And we obviously have to, to get people housed first 
but at the exact same time as you get them housed, if you don't address why they are unhoused, then it's not going to last. Now, what I worry about in a campaign, when people paint such a horrible picture of the city, the city's going to hell in a handbasket, there's crime everywhere, this is just you know, the worst place in the world, then that lends to policies that are very negative, that are punitive, and that wind up essentially criminalizing poverty. So even if you have lost all empathy and you just say, I want these people away from me, I really don't care what happens to them, that's gonna lead to them being arrested, and guess what? They're gonna be in jail for three days, and then they will be right back out, and they will either be on your street or somebody else's street. And so we as a city and a county have got to make a decision that we are going to solve this. I also do not believe that it can be solved by the city. It has to be a regional approach. If you think about from a regional perspective, we also have a lot of land. If you think about it just from a city perspective, we're kind of landlocked. And so I think that you have to figure out the city and the county, for whatever reason, don't want to work together. And, and it's really kind of dumb because there's no particular reason. It's not regulatory, it's not administrative, it's more, it's more I think, ego and turf. And, and while people are dealing with ego and turf, folks are dying on these streets. It's always interesting. I've been um, on the air here almost two decades, and to, I, it always baffles me, LA City Fire and LA County Fire. So just touching on that, I never really uh, thought about the, the separation. I don't even think I was aware of that separation well, well, you know, on the, the county and city level. Well, well, the separation is, is because the county provides services. Mm -hmm. The city builds buildings. And so what, as far as yeah. yeah. You have to work hand in glove yeah. because you have to have them both. So, you know, we, we do crazy things. I mean, the lawsuit that was just settled that was between the Alliance and, and the city and the county, the Alliance sued both, but these, the, it was settled with just the city. So without both partners there, you're not going to address the problem. So we talked about homelessness and also empathy, and it's our local residents who are clearly on the streets. And we're, I want to- It's the students in the schools. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Like I, I, was, I touched upon holidays, and one of the most unforgettable moments was holidays, going to the Midnight Mission and, and to Skid Row and seeing moms with babies in strollers and children getting the toys, the only toys they're getting for the year. So I, I absolutely don't want to forget those families. So how do we educate these kids who, who you know, are concerned about having a roof over their head and just you know, getting food in their stomachs, which we do, have, we do a wonderful job of feeding yes. our students more, better than any other state. But how do we help them? And especially there's, there's problems of you know, children who seek an escape and, and they may only find safety in gangs or uh, other groups that might feel like they could protect them. See, the, the, the frustrating thing to me is that we know what to do. We know how to do this. We know proven strategies mm -hmm. to, to deter kids from, from gangs. We j and we also know how to prevent crime. We just refuse to really make the investment that's needed. And then what we do is, is that you, know, you have a spike in crime or you have an increased gang uh, issue like you know, was discovered a, a couple of weeks ago with the drive home. Uh, robberies, and so then we throw money at it, and then crime gets a little better, and then we take the money away. Mm -hmm. And then when crime goes up again, we blame the community. So, you know, I, I think it's a cycle. It's just like with homelessness. We have people that know how to deal with homelessness. We have wonderful providers that know how to get people off the street, that know how to house folks, but we don't give them enough resources to reach scale to actually solve the problem. Do you think there are areas where we overspend? that it could be moved to another area? Or are we lacking the Well, you know, the funds? I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe there is. There's always a possibility of that. But instead of robbing Peter to pay Paul, I would rather look at expanding the pie. And I know that there's money there. Like I said, finding that, uh, that LA leaves millions of di dollars on the table uh, on the federal side. You know, we have a number of wealthy people. And, I mean, come on. It's, it's really a question to me of, of leadership determination and, um, and, and the commitment to say, I'm gonna make the hard decisions that is gonna be needed in order to get the job done. Well, it's frustrating when you hear the governor talk about you know, a massive state surplus that we weren't expected and we don't feel like we see it down here or it, you know, it doesn't feel like it trickles down even though 
we're the largest city in the state. Well, and it does trickle down. I mean, you know, the protection for renters, you know, I think he's gonna put in 1.6 billion of the surplus for a homelessness. You know, so it does trickle down. The question is, is the money used in the best fashion? Is it used strategically? Uh, or is it used to make a situation a little better versus eliminate the situation? All right. Do you, would you like to wrap up with any comments? Or I, I could ask you questions all day, but I've gone far past oh, my I education have this answers. Conversation because all you, day too. I, I, I could just keep talking, but I've gone far past all of the questions that were have been extended to everybody. But I want to make sure if there's anything you would like to touch upon, I can go on and on. But like I said, I've gone far off script. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're having fun. And, she, and she's going to get mad at us. <laughs> how, how many minutes do we have left? One and a oh, half. Okay. Well, let me just take the opportunity to thank everyone here for what you do for our children. Um, because, you know, you, you work in education, you save lives. Uh, that's the bottom line. And you're key to us addressing income inequality and all of these issues because it's about educating and, and taking care of our kids. But since I have another minute, I, I, I don't mean to embarrass somebody, but I, I can't resist. I have to talk about Elmer Rodan. I'm sorry, Elmer, but I do. <laughs> I'm just so proud of this young man who I can't call that young anymore. But uh, <laughs> I know you got some gray up there. <laughs> but I, I met Elmer when he was barely in high school, and he was a, uh, a youth leader at Community Coalition. And it's just, there's nothing that warms my heart more than to see a young person who, you know, my whole thing is, is that I believe that our battle for justice goes on forever. And so it's just critically important that you focus on the next generation and passing that baton and to know that the baton got passed and he's a leader, he's executive director of communities and schools is, I'm very proud of. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can yell at me later. <laughs> That was a beautiful way to wrap up the evening. Elmer, thank you for hosting this event tonight. And for you to be here, Karen, it was so nice talking to you. Thank I you. could talk to you all night. <laughs> thank you so much. I'll take the mic for And will I be welcoming Elmer? Anybody back to the stage? Uh oh, is our alarm going off? Actually, I can wrap up as well. Would you like to wrap up? Okay, I'll say my little wrap-up. Sorry, let me move these mics. I'll turn them off. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay, let me do my formal goodbye. We want to thank all candidates who are present here today for sharing their education platforms and ideas to improve the quality of education for our children and youth in this great city of Los Angeles that we all call home. I want to thank the attendees here tonight for your participation and remind you that the state primary election, which includes this election for mayor of Los Angeles, will be on the June 7th election ballot. You can register to vote before May 23rd and request to vote by mail before May 9th. You can find more resources on the tables outside. And thank you and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>